Welcome back to another episode of Apostate of Mind, where we take a critical and scholarly approach to religion and its sacred writings. I'm Mark Peralta, an ex-evangelical pastor and learner of the Bible. And today we bring you part one of two episodes where Dr. Kip Davies and I take a deep dive and provide you with an in-depth analysis of the research that has been recently published against the so-called Mount Ebal inscription. And the most recent video that was published by Sean McDowell on the subject. Now, if you don't know who Dr. Kip Davis is, he is a PhD from Manchester University on religion and theology. He's also an expert in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Hebrew Bible, and in paleography. So before we get started, Dr. Davis, I'm going to bring you in. And if you could please give us an overview of like what we're talking about and where we are in the process, like what has been published and, you know, who are the leading experts on this? I, I think we first heard about this in 2020, early 2020. Scott Stripling, who is an archaeologist at a tiny uh, little Bible college seminary in a place called Katy, Texas. The only reason I know about Katy, Texas is because there was a Canadian Football League quarterback from there by the name of Bo Levi Mitchell, <laughs> who played for my favorite Canadian football team, the Calgary Stampeders, for a time. But uh, that's the only reason I think anybody should know about Katy, Texas. Uh, but apparently there's this seminary there, right? And Scott Stripling is an archaeologist at this at this very conservative uh, Christian seminary. He also works for the Associates of Biblical Research, which is another very conservative evangelical Christian organization, which attempts to promote um, doc, doc Christian important Christian doctrines such as biblical inerrancy and the historical reliability of scripture through material culture and discoveries in, in archaeology. And, you know, they've, they've got uh, a, a bit of a sketchy record of involvement in, in the work in the, uh, in the region. Anyways, uh, Stripling works for the ABR and he was undertaking this, it was a it was a salvage operation at a site on Mount Abal, which was first excavated by Adam Zertal back in the 1980s. And Stripling was working on on uh, wet sifting Zertal's debris piles, basically, in an effort to try and, and see if they could uncover some more material culture. You know, the way this works when an archaeologist digs at a site, you're you're digging up the earth, the ground, and everything gets deposited in these debris piles, right? So this is, you know, 30 years later, Stripling and his team are coming along and sifting through these piles, and they found a tiny lead object, which is, is two centimeters by four centimeters and folded. So it looks literally just like a, like a two centimeter by two centimeter square. And like, that's tiny. It's, it's, a, you know, a little bit bigger than, than my, my thumb, basically. And it, it it's a man-made uh, object that looks uh, manufactured. It's got striations on the outside. They made the announcement that they had discovered a defixio, a lead defixio, which is a type of ancient curse tablet, a tiny little metal tablet on which ancient people would scribble words of a curse, then fold and then, you know, throw into the, the altar or into the fire or or whatever. And that basically affects the curse. So they announced that there's writing that they could decipher on this tiny little tablet. And most significantly, they said that uh, they discovered it was written in Proto-Hebrew. They dated the object all the way back to the uh, 13th century BCE, which would be a monumental discovery on a number of fronts. In the first place, they suggested that the, the writing was in Proto-Hebrew. This is a f the very early form of Canaanite writing basically developed from Egyptian hieroglyphs. These are the first, first letters, the first style 
of uh, of of an alphabet basically in and used in and around Canaan. Proto-Hebrew. So right away, this would be very exciting because it it, it would indicate that there is Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew alphabet and Hebrew writing all the way back in the 13th century in the Levant, in Palestine or Israel. Because at this point, we we have nothing all the all the Hebrew epigraphic remains, all the Canaanite epigraphic remains come from quite a bit later, 9th, 8th, 7th, 6th century. So this is pushing it way, way back. Stripling also identified the defixio quite specifically with the conquest of uh, Joshua of Canaan. So importantly for him, this object was part of the ritual performed on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, which is uh, recorded in, well, not recorded, we're, we're, it's narrated, we're told about this in um, Joshua chapter, chapter 8, I believe, where the, uh, and, 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 sorry, first of all, in uh, the, it, it's first, it's first mentioned in Deuteronomy 27, where the Israelites are gathered on uh, on both sides of the uh, the valley overlooking uh, Shechem, and on either side of the valley are two mountains, Mount Abal on the I think it's the north side, and Mount uh, Gerizim on the south side. I might have my geography mixed up a little bit offhand, uh, but they're on two sides of the valley, and according to the text. Joshua separated, you know, the the people on on each mountain. So the uh, the the tribes of uh, Judah and Benjamin, I believe, were on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing, and or do I have that backwards? Yeah, it's they were on Mount Abal, the Mount of Blessing, and nope, I do have. Sorry, you'll cut this up. So they had they had all the people gathered on uh, on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing, and then all the other people from like the ten tribes were gathered on the other mountain uh, across the valley, the Mount of the Curse, and they shouted across the valley back and forth to one another these blessings and these curses, and then they uh, they had an altar on Mount Abal where they they made a sacrifice. So Stripling, I basically identified this object with this event. And significantly, because it's a defixio, because he thought that they could decipher uh, words inside it, and we'll get to that in a little bit here, which indicated that the, the suggestion was that it contained this curse formula. And very significantly, also an early form of the name Yahweh, uh, Yod He Vav Yaho, and we know we know of of this as a you know an an early form of the name Yahweh from from a handful of other um, actual inscriptions and um, text objects. So this is what all the excitement was about when it was first announced in and around 2020. There was lots of skepticism about this in no small part because this was an ABR operation. There were a lot of scholars who were like, you know, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and in addition, it's the, based on what we know about uh, these primitive early Hebrew scripts, based on what we know of the spread of, of epigraphy in the region, there was a huge amount of skepticism that this was legitimately, you know, either dated correctly as early as it was to the 13th century or identified correctly as, you know, an artifact or, or as an inscription, as an inscribed artifact, basically. So that's, that's kind of where this started. Stripling and the ABR hosted a a press conference at Lanier Theological Library there in uh, in Houston, Texas, is where the where the press conference was held, um, where they made this announcement. Prior to anything having been published, they they announced that uh, they 
had made this discovery. They announced what what the text read, and they promised that there would be a publication uh, forthcoming. So we uh, at first it was, if I remember correctly, the the publication uh, would would arrive by the end of uh, 2020 and that never happened. And then I remember seeing Stripling in an interview somewhere else talking about how they had it submitted to a, a journal and it would be ready within like the next three or four months. And that never happened. And then I heard him or saw him in another interview uh, some months after that saying that uh that that they were they were still looking for a journal and it, it went on like this for a while until then finally it was published in uh the journal heritage science uh which is an open access journal there's the there it is that that one there so it, it, it's an open access journal which is really good because everyone can read it uh heritage science is is a, a a publication that specializes in particular in imagery and in uh the use of uh of new technology in uh material culture especially so it was a it seemed like a natural place to to publish some of the findings because in order to read the inside of this tablet they couldn't open it they had to take these 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 what are called tomographic scans so and and you know that was the rationale for publishing it in this journal the problem with that is that uh, heritage science does not really specialize in archaeology of the place and the period in you know it's not a levantine it's not not the sort of place you would ordinarily publish uh, Levantine archaeology. So, you know, right away, uh, again, scholars were suspicious. When we got a chance to look at the article, the response was almost resoundingly universally negative. Like, I have seen on Twitter, it was, it was instantaneous. Scholars, uh, respected epigraphers and biblical scholars from all over the place were were weighing in on uh, on just how ridiculous uh, the readings on this tablet were. I saw uh, Robert Cargill, who is at uh, University of Iowa, I believe. He's a uh, he's a Levantine archaeologist. He he made a video about it fairly fairly shortly after the article was published on his YouTube channel. I know Inspiring Philosophy, Michael Jones interviewed a, a Christian uh, Hebrew Bible scholar about it. And he likewise, you know, decried the the discovery and the publication as, as absolutely ridiculous. I made a video with uh, with my friend Paul Legia about the numerous problems of this, uh, this artifact. Christopher Rolston, who is probably the greatest living uh, epigrapher, Hebrew epigrapher, uh, Semitic, Semitic language epigrapher of, um, of the period and the region. He came out on his blog and disputed the, the claims made in the article. And he, he also made an appearance on, um, on Sean McDowell's YouTube channel to, uh, to dispel a bunch of the nonsense regarding the artifact. So, the scholarly response was was resounding and it was clear. No one was convinced by this. In the intervening time, I think it was uh, when was the um, the Israel Exploration Journal articles published? Twenty twenty three. Myers. Oh, were they public? Were they published in twenty twenty three as well? Oh yeah, they were. Okay, so that was pretty quick after uh, after. The publication by um, uh, Stripling and his team, a group of scholars, including Christopher Rolston, Aidan Meyer, it's uh, Meyer and Mac and Mazar, Matt and Mac and Mazar. Yes, um, <clears throat> they contributed three articles in the Israel Exploration Journal, basically responding to the claims made by Stripling and his team in the Heritage science article and 
it just echoed much of of the same sort of sentiments that have been that have been promoted for some time in public public media in in public spaces where 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 scholars do talk about these things and uh yeah the uh, the three articles Rolston and Meyer published an article about specifically about the problems of the epigraphy uh Meyer published an article in which he made a um you know, a, an alternative case for what the object is. And he has suggested that it's a, um, it's an ancient uh, sinker, like a, like a fishing weight uh, used for, for holding a, holding a fishing net down. And then the, uh, the article by um, what's her name? Yahalo Mac. Uh, Mac. Yeah, Halon Mac, Yahalo Mac. She, th- this was basically the isotropic analysis of the uh, the lead, the, the the material analysis, which basically concluded that it came from the uh, Lavrion region in Greece. So, but that's that's kind of it's kind of the story, <laughs> and, and it's really interesting the response because when I yeah, first looked at the heritage article and the claim, I thought, surely this is a multidisciplinary thing, effort, effort, because you've got material involved, you've got epigraphy involved, you've got archaeology involved. And it just seemed seemed a little suspect to me that the only place where he got some publishing was a technology journal. And, you know, if, if you didn't, if you didn't follow the story, uh, as far back as I did, um, you know, you wouldn't have seen this either, right? Like the other big problem that uh, that we saw was the fact that he, Stripling and his team, appear to have had some difficulty finding, you know, a place to publish it. There were several false starts in there before they landed at Heritage Science. And the article came out like a good two years later than they had, uh, than they had first promised it. It was uh, it was quite something, but uh, and honestly, like when I when I first saw the article, I was in absolute disbelief. <laughs> Just at the um, at I guess I guess the 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 flimsiness of the uh, of the work that that had gone into reading a text on an object. When I think most scholars are agreed, there is there is nothing there. There is no text on this object. The striations that Stripling and his his epigraphers uh, Gershon Galil and um, Peter Van Voorst and is there is there another one? There's uh, Ivana Kompova, Yaroslav Valage, and Peter Gert. I think those are the. Hmm. Apo- tomog- that- topography guys. Yeah, Ivana Kompova. So Ivana Kompova, Yaroslav Valach. Uh, are the yeah so it's uh peter van der veen and gershon galil were the uh were the epigraphers so i i mean i think i've heard him talk about having three epigraphers working on the on the object but um those other those other people i'm pretty sure are are, are the science the science team right yeah applied in mechanics. addition to yeah right did you pull it up the article I'm looking at the footnotes. Yeah. On the article. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but it, it was, it was shocking to me how, how these, you know, these epigraphers were basically, you know, reading text out of what amount to striations and, uh, uh, wear on the metal. It's uh, it's quite something, and this is this is generally the uh, the the view of most um, most epigraphers, most most scholars who whose opinion on um, on inscriptions is is the one we should pay the most attention to. We're hearing the same thing, right? Everything just just looks like like natural wear and tear on on the metal so and and just uh to be clear the the stripling's response on sean mcdowell's channel was specifically directed towards these three articles which really are um the the definitive scholarly statement 
on the uh, monoball Chris tablet, I would say at this up to this point, right? So these these three articles that were published in the Israel Exploration Journal. Thank you very much, Dr. Davis, for that great introduction. And what do you say we get started with the video? Yeah, let's do it. Now, folks, if you want to learn more from Dr. Davis, you can do this. You can do three things. The easiest one would be to subscribe to his channel, Dr. Kip Davis on YouTube, where he's got a ton of amazing videos there. My new favorite segment in YouTube, Diablo Critics, is featured in his channel. You want to check it out. It's a monthly live event with other scholars like himself. Number two, you can purchase his books on, you know, Amazon. And number three, I want you to check out mvp-courses.com where you can find his latest course titled Real Israelite Religions, Facts on the Ground and Propaganda in the Bible for a very, very small fee of $49.95. You'll get access to 18 lectures, folks. A lot of great material there. So that's it. Thank you, Dr. Davis. And um, let's get started. Journal articles, professional journal articles have been critiquing the find and Scott Stripling is back to offer his response. So maybe just kind of remind us somewhat briefly of the find, what you think it reveals, and why you believe it's significant before we get into the critique and your response. In December 2019, we sifted the dump piles that Adam Zertal had left behind at Mount Ebal, east and west dump piles. And the east dump is very ashy. It was material that he noted was from the altar. The west dump is very different from that. We recovered through wet sifting a small folded lead item that we believe is a, a tablet or a defixio. And using tomographic scanning, we were able to penetrate the lead and see what we believe are proto-alphabetic letters on the inside of that. We published this in Heritage Science and we um, gave our proposed interpretation uh, with all the nuances that we realize that there's many different ways to read this. It could be read forward, backward, top to bottom, and so forth. But a proposed reading of it. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. We'll, we'll get to exactly how you can read this, right? <laughs> and um, this was responded to recently by a series of scholars. I would note that their choice of journals was curious because Aaron Mayer is an editor of IEJ. Oh, and you see so, me sighing, don't you? I, it looked like you were about to say <laughs> something because I'm thinking these are the appropriate uh, journals. Why this is, is he just there, right? It, this is such a this is such a this is such a piddling complaint in my view, um, because it's not like it's not like uh, uh, Aaron Meyer is the only editor <laughs> over at uh, IEJ, um, and this really is probably the most appropriate venue um, for this uh, this type of response. Well, you have the editor assessing his own uh, work here and that's a so, little problematic. And, like I and and I very I'm just gonna repeat this. I very, very seriously doubt that uh, Meyer served as his own reviewer. On his article, there are the way the peer review process works is and and this is this is for every journal that I've ever submitted articles to. And I have reviewed um, I've served as a peer reviewer for, for for journals as well. The editor of the journal is not usually is not the one sitting and doing the peer review on all the articles. The editor of the journal is sending these are he's the one who's selecting peer reviewers, and this is all volunteer, right? Like I will get an email every now and then from a, uh, from an academic journal, from an editor saying, I have an article here. This is the subject of the article. Would you be interested in reviewing it for our journal? And then I, I say yes or no, you know, and they give me a time limit as to when to have my, my, um, my, um, report and my, uh, um, my verdict in. So he's not, he's not reviewing his own article. This would have been sent out to, you know, uh, blind reviewers somewhere else. Would they be blind in that, in that sort of way? 
They should be, right? And I would expect so because in in virtually every situation I've ever worked in, uh, in in the peer review process, it's it's been uh, it's been blind. So I have uh, in in articles that I have reviewed, I I have not known who the authors were i sometimes found out after you know after they were published and i noticed i was like oh hey <laughs> in in instances where i've submitted my own work they don't tell me who's reviewing but there and there are a couple of instances uh on on the other side of that as well where uh once an article of mine was published somebody did come and pull me aside and say hey i was you know i was one of your reviewers and yeah. So like, like in the process, when you're in the moment in the process, no, you don't know who, who your reviewers are. So it sounds like he's either ignorant of the process or it's kind of maybe being a little defensive and misrepresenting, poisoning the well, sort of like, hey, here's a reason why you should not trust these experts. Right. It, it certainly sounds that way. And it's very difficult for me uh, to think that Stripling doesn't know how this works. Right. So I don't know, <laughs> yeah. but the, you know, pro one of the problems with the field with, with, with some of these fields are that they're small enough that, that you, you kind of know everybody in them. So, um, you know, there's, and there's only so many people you can go to, like when it comes to, when it comes to assessing paleography or epigraphy from the early iron age, like there's only a small handful of people in the entire world that you can go to, to review that kind of stuff. So in my own field, like in uh, most, all of my, all of my published work, uh, academic published work tends to be in Dead Sea Scrolls, early Jewish literature. But specifically when it comes to the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's a small enough community that I, I still pretty much know everybody who's working, actively working on, uh, on the scrolls. So, you know, most of the time, even though an article is sent out for when an article is sent out for peer review and it's blind and you're not told uh, who the author is and you know the author never is never told who the reviewer was there's a good chance you do know them right even if if uh, if you don't uh, if you don't know who they are in the moment wow so I mean the fact that he was unable to get you know this this thing published in the proper journal that it's always been like, very I mean, fishy that, to me. It was just maybe right. not accepted, right? There's there, there's a vetting process where. So yeah, there is. Um, I'm not sure if that's the primary reason though. Um, there's I, I I've talked a little bit about this when I've talked about this before, but there are like there's legal issues surrounding this whole thing too that we just don't have the time or the space to get into. Uh, you know the uh, the discovery of an artifact or or the removal in the first place of an artifact from what amounts to basically occupied territory in Palestine in the first place. And then the movement of that artifact out of Israel to the Czech Republic for scanning, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of concern surrounding the very, like the legality of all of that. And I have my suspicions that me, the reason they struggled to find a place to publish had more to do with that actually oh, than, nice. um, than the, uh, the, the content of their findings uh, overall. But I honestly, I have no idea. I just, I, I see the whole situation and it looks really sketchy to me. Just, yeah. you know, the fact that, took so long and you had to go to so many different places and it ended up in this, in this kind of strange, uh, I, I, not, not that it's a strange, a, 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 a venue that is unexpected. I'll say that. So it seems a little shady and mm. we don't know exactly what went on, but it certainly raises some red flags. Yeah. Right. Um, I would rather that it had been published in a neutral journal where he did not have editorial control or say over it um, because it makes it difficult then for us in responding, and we will academically respond, 
but you know, to submit back to IEJ when we're disagreeing with the editor, um, oh. it's it's a bit problematic. Okay, I see. So you plan on an academic response? I would. Response. So I I don't I don't think that's that should be in any way problematic. As I said, while uh, Meyer is the editor of the IAJ, he's not he's not the the dictator of the right. Israel Exploration Journal, right? Like there's more people involved in this, and there's no reason why Stripling shouldn't get a fair hearing if he's got the data. So this is an initial response that you wanted to get out there, but you're skeptical whether IEJ would publish it. Would that be your first option? If not, you go to another similar journal? Well, I'll give you one answer today and a different one tomorrow. I, I, okay. I'm really not sure if we'll get a fair hearing there. I would like to publish it there, okay. um, but still processing that. Okay, fair enough. Isn't Why it interesting? Do you pause it for a second? This is like this is the same thing that happened, right? In this whole story from the start, this is this has been this has been the procedure. Stripling goes out and makes a public announcement. First, they had that big press conference, and then when the when the journal article came out, literally like a few days before the journal article itself came out, he was on Sean McDowell's channel talking about it. Mm -hmm. Right, and again here, you know, I just wanted to. He says something about just wanting to. To, to to get this out there now and make this this uh, this response uh, in you know the the public media now before uh, actually publishing a journal article this is this is like ass backwards <laughs> yeah he should have maybe replied with another journal article before you know doing his press tour with Sean McDowell but these guys work differently. Thanks so long. The rest of us are kind of observing this, saying, hey, we just want to know if this is a cursed tablet, if it puts back kind of the writing of old Hebrew by 200 years, as you claim. Why can't we just have a big roundtable discussion here, sift through the difference, pun intended, and settle this thing? Yeah, I mean, we have to dot every I and cross every T, and you're talking about very meticulous things, multiple languages, and different time periods, and we're, we're dealing with things like a co-author has cancer, and we've got a pandemic, and oh now we've got goodness. a war. You know, we've got wars, pandemics, and, okay. you know, cancers, and so it just, life happens, and it, it takes longer than we would like. That's fair. So one of these articles, again, that this, this appeared in the Israel Exploration Journal is by Nama Yachalom Mack, and it says, it's titled, The Source of the Lead in the Mount Ebal Tablet. Now, by the way, these first two are important, but really the third one that we get to seems most pressing and consequential for the issues that we're debating. But this kind of lays the groundwork we need to get to. So this is called The Source of the Lead in the Mount Ebal Tablet. Now, Yahalom Mack analyzes the tablet through what's called lead isotope analysis and concludes that the lead can be sourced to the mines in Lavrion in Greece, which, as I understand, is one of the largest, richest, and oldest in the Mediterranean region. A hundred square miles the size of this mine is, and it dates from the fourth millennium BC until the late Roman period. That is a massive, massive uh, time frame. And he says this analysis is inconclusive as to the date of the tablet. So here's his conclusion that I want you to jump in. He says the suggestion of Mozart that the alleged inscribed tablet is in fact a fishing net weight sinker is supported by the results presented here. As additional net sinkers are isotopically consistent with the Mount Ebal artifact and were likely made of lead from the same source. Now our next article we're going to get to the fishing weight sinker and your thoughts on that. But his analysis is basically that it's kind of inconclusive and we can't use the lead to date this thing in the way you guys suggest. Uh, first of all, uh, Nama is female. Uh, Professor oh. Yahalo Mack is female. Um, did, she did a, uh, a really good job. I'm the one who asked her to do the, the isotope analysis. Uh, she did it, did a fair job on it. Um, she brings up something slightly that Mayer and Rolston go into in depth which is a straw man argument. And there's a number of these that I'm going to point out while we're talking today, saying that we said things we didn't say. Um, okay. I, I never said that that was the source of, of dating. 
never okay. never said it publicly, never said it in writing. Certainly, um, didn't say it in the- so yeah. uh, I'm fairly sure that uh, that this is something that that Stripling has made a big deal about publicly, at least. Um, I would have to go back and and check the tapes, and there's a lot of them. Um, you know, there's there's five or six interviews with him and some of his colleagues prior to uh, the article actually coming out, and then there's the 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 show that he did on Sean McDowell's channel, right? Um, when the article first came out, and this is a point that he makes. He he continues to come back on the uh, the the source of the lead coming from the Lavrion region. It's not a single mine, by the way. It's like, like it, it's, it's a region within, within Greece where, you know, there was uh, extensive mining activity for thousands of years. Um, but he does in, in many of his public talks makes a big deal about this as an isolating feature of determining the date of the object it's something that that has been brought up by uh, by a number of scholars in responding to him in fact i and and something that i did notice when i heard him say i never said this in the article i went back and checked because i was like i'm pretty sure i remember him saying something about uh the origin of the lead in lavrion from the article he wrote and uh here's what he says about it, but I think it's interesting. He says the initial lab analysis by Orna Cohen, I am reading from page three, by the way, second column, third paragraph. The initial lab analysis by Orna Cohen revealed that the tablet could not be unfolded without damaging it. Metallurgical analysis of the tablet's lead by Professor Naama Yahalomak at Hebrew University revealed that it derived from a mine in the Aegean, Lavrion, Greece, which was known to be used in the late Bronze Age. Mm -hmm. Now, something that he, to his credit, he's not saying we know this object dates uh, to the late Bronze Age because it comes from Lavrion. At least he's not saying that here. But I can't help but notice that what he does say is just that. That because it comes from Lavrion and because the the mines were in use in the late Bronze Age, he seems to be implying that this does contribute to the dating of the artifact. At the very least, it looks like it's giving him a range, correct? Yeah, but I mean, uh, he doesn't in his own article, he doesn't he doesn't provide the full range, though, either. And all the problems associated with that, like um, McDowell pointed it out, uh, you know, the, the, the Lavrion mines were in operation as early as the fourth millennium BC, which is crazy, right? Um, but there were still, they were still mining silver. It's a silver mine and lead is a byproduct of silver. They were still mining silver out of Lavrion all the way into the Roman period. So like, all the way up to 200 BCE. It's just an enormous range to the point that it it doesn't seem particularly meaningful uh, to me. So uh, I for, for stripping to complain about scholars' reactions to him on this point is 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 strange to me because yes, we agree that this isn't a good this isn't a good feature for isolating the date of the fragment of, of the object. But if that's the case, then why were you running around in many of your public interviews talking about the lead coming from Lavrion and this somehow helping to establish the, the date back into the bronze? And she's going to say a little something more about this here in a minute. And I'll, I'll chime in again, but. You know, I I don't feel like he's being perfectly perfectly straightforward here, and and I, I think he doesn't mention also the possibility that it could have been reused. As this is the thing, or often, <laughs> and this is this is something that uh, that Rolston and uh, Meyer actually mentioned in their own article. I'll just uh, I'll just 
I, I can just just read that now. They say that uh, uh, because one of the one of the issues that Stripling is going to get to here that is significant in his mind is coordinating the the activity at the Lavrion mine and the exports of silver with the Bronze Age collapse, which happened in the 13th century BCE. So in view of this, what uh, um, uh, Myron Rolston say is that either such metals arrived in Canaan during the late bronze and continued to be used in Iron Age one, or as increasing evidence suggests, international trade did not halt completely at the end of the late Bronze Age, and there are a number of uh, of citations they provide to to show that. Uh, thus, due to the fact that lead and other objects could easily be reused long after their extraction, trade, and original use, and the possibility that lead from the Aegean may have reached Canaan in the early Iron Age, the provenance of the lead from the Mount Abal object cannot be seen as conclusive for the dating of the object. So what they're basically saying there, and I said this in the, uh, in the, the video response I did in, uh, the Apologia, uh, video that in antiquity, the people were tremendously good recyclers, um, by necessity. You didn't throw much away. You reused as much as you could metal, all types of metal was extremely valuable and useful. Uh, so it seems very unlikely to me that you can isolate a single object made of metal to a single period, right? Unless, uh, unless it's a coin, right? That's got, that's been stamped with a, a, a date or something, right? Like that's sort of its final, but even then uh, a coin can be in circulation for, for decades, centuries, right <laughs> before, after the fact, and this is this is what we have happening here too. You have what what uh, the isotropic analysis has managed to do is to isolate the location of where the lead came from, um, and we can make some speculations regarding the age uh, relative to what we know about you know exports in the period. Um, but if that lead arrived in Canaan in the Bronze Age, it probably stayed there for a very long time. And maybe its use changed over that period of time. Maybe it was something else before it became whatever it is now and was deposited at the site. Like there's, you know, there, there is there is all sorts of of possibilities here with regards to to the the useful life of this object yeah and forgive my very amateur understanding of archaeology but i think that's where maybe perhaps it would have been useful if the tablet had been found like in situ in situ that's right which <laughs> right? He also exactly uh, shocked me that he didn't mention you know the limitations of what's happening because oh. it was not found in situ and this is this is such a this is such a huge problem, uh, insofar as this this find is concerned. But he'll he'll say something more about that in a little bit. So I'll save that. Okay. All right. All right. Here we go. Heritage Science uh, article. What I said was that it comes from a mine in Lavrion, Greece, which was in use in the late Bronze Age, and normally. That would be the end of it. It's also in use in many other periods. However, we so, all agree. And listen, you- like this is this is the thing. Why why did you settle on just the late Bronze Age when we know that it's in use in many other periods? Like that that looks sloppy to me. Yeah, and in in, in his conclusion, he says, uh, but no later than circa twelve fifty BCE. So he puts. That bracket and, there, the and no I later. Think he'll he'll say why here in a minute, and and I think that's that's somewhat dubious as okay. a claim. You know, by now, Sean, we don't all agree on very much, but we 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 all agree that around 1200 there was a massive collapse of civilization in the Levant, 
And so exports from the Aegean into Canaan, Israel, cease or come to a trickle uh, around that time. That's an important difference, don't you think? Mm -hmm. They didn't. He says they ceased. No, they didn't. They came to a trickle. They certainly slowed down. Um, but as as pointed out in uh, in uh, the article by um, by Meyer and um, uh, and Rolston, uh, I actually I wrote this down here. Let me see if I can find this. Um, the uh, hold on. Yeah, uh, in their article, Myron Rolston actually note in their article that there is another silver object that from the Aegean that was recently discovered in an early Iron One site in the Levant, right? Okay. So, I mean, it, it doesn't... It doesn't have to be an all-or-nothing thing here, and this this is, this is something that, that Stripling should know um the the bronze age collapse didn't mean that the world just stopped functioning altogether oh, you mean like when the flood came <laughs> maybe that's it yeah, maybe that's it came, right <laughs> all things stop is that the is that the bronze age collapse it's yeah. the it's the flood so for people who just just to give people an idea um so uh in the uh, in the late Bronze Age, which is you know roughly fifteen hundred to I think it's it's twelve fifty or twelve twenty BCE, there were uh, basically uh, three or four great powers around the Mediterranean. There was Egypt in the south. There was uh, the Hittite Empire in the north. There was the Mycenaeans in um, Greece, um, and then like. The Assyrians, Babylonians out in the uh, uh, out in the east. So, um, and they were. This was certainly a period for like three hundred years. Um, character basically characterizes like a, like like a maybe the the first age of of globalization. Uh, there was an enormous amount of uh, trade and interaction between. Uh, these groups you've got goods circulating all over the place um, and we have excellent records from most of these places as well now there is a there are still some gaps in our knowledge about what happened but it seems that in and around the beginning of the 12th century uh, a series of of natural uh, uh, events. Uh, there was there was significant drought in the uh, in the Hittite Empire. Um, I think there was flooding. Uh, you know, enormous amounts of flooding in in Egypt, which which caused some issues. I might be wrong about that. Um, there were there were uh, uh, some some plagues in the region that 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 happened, and, and this is all over the the course of of like this all didn't happen just all at once, right? This is over the course of, of decades, really. Um, but these, these series of, of events uh, caused a substantial um, weakening of certainly the two, the two greatest of these powers, the, the Hittites in the North and the Egyptians in the South. In fact, um, within about a hundred years, the Hittite empire is, is basically gone. Uh, just wiped off the map. This coincides with the emergence of this group of people that uh, that we know of, who's migrating into Canaan, known as the Sea People. The sea Peoples, yeah. Right, and and the Sea People are not like like a like a nation. It's a it's a designation given by uh, a couple of the pharaohs. Um, was it Akhenaten? I think, and uh, Amenhotep, 
maybe the third i i'm gonna get that wrong so i'm not even gonna bother but a couple of the pharaohs gave these people this designation and i think scholars tend to agree that this is the these are just uh people basically migrating out of the aegean out of the hittite empire in the north and coming into uh canaan right one of the things that they're doing as they're entering canaan is they are they are sacking and burning the existing uh canaanite cities there many of which are under egyptian control Mm -hmm. um So this is all kind of happening at the same time. And as a result, remember I said that the Hittite Empire basically collapses. The Mycenaean Empire had a a collapse, uh, I think it was 60, 70, 80 years before that. The Egyptian Empire is is substantially weakened and basically has to pull pull back Mm -hmm. from Canaan. They're still active in the area, right? Like, like Egypt never, um, is never just kicked right out of Canaan. They're still there. It's just their, their influence has waned considerably. Um, so it's, it's this period, this period that scholars identify as the so-called bronze age collapse is basically the end of this golden age of commercial trade and cooperation between the great empires and there seems to be um, this this shattering, really, of these large imperial powers, which provides a climate for the emergence of like a like a new type of um, social organization. There's a lot more clustering around these smaller individual city states. Uh, we see this in particular. This is really when the population in Canaan starts to explode. It, you know, they burn a bunch of the the existing cities there, but these these new um, uh, these new settlements start to pop up all over the place. Um, so this is this is what he's talking about. Now, importantly, you'll notice that the Bronze Age collapse doesn't mean the end of civilization. It just means a shift right there's still people out there they still need to trade with one another um the the ships didn't suddenly stop sailing the mediterranean and they didn't suddenly stop moving goods from from port to port it just it changed it was different right so yeah (laughs) yeah and there's definitely materials or products that survive events such as that Yes, uh, that are like you know recession-proof things. Sort of. There are there are definitely recession-proof things. Excellent. All right, let's move on. So, therefore, as uh, Rolston and Mayer point out in their article, a different source of lead is used at Iron Age One. Now, that's very important. Yahalom. Here we have the the analysis of our lead. We know that it's in use in LB. We know that a different, according to Rolston and Mayer, and they're right a different source of lead is being used in Iron Age 1. Well, there's only two yeah, choices. Hold on for a second, though. Yeah. But as I read Meyer and Rolston, not exclusively, right? Like, they say that there's still finding... It's certainly certainly not as much uh, lead and silver is being exported out of, out of the Aegean into the Levant. But they are indicating that that it's there's there's still reason to think that that um, silver could be coming into the area. Um, I'm not entirely sure why why Stripling is stuck on this idea that by the time of Iron One, there's just no lead and no silver from Lavrion to be found anywhere in uh, in Israel. That seems silly to me. For dating the tablet, and we'll dig into that a little bit deeper in a minute, and that's LB2 and Iron Age 1. So if it's from Lavrion and it can't be Iron Age 1, then it must be Iron Age 2. It's implying that. It's suggesting that. I never said on its own that that proves anything. I'm saying that it's plausible. So I think it's a bit of a straw man argument, but that's my response to that. But listen, Mr. – sorry, Dr. Stripling, when you lean that hard into an argument – they have a tendency to come back on you 
in print, you have implied this, but in many of your, your public talks, you've really, really pushed this idea that the origin of the lead from Lavrigon is significant for the dating of the tablet. And, you know, I just, I just don't think it is. Not especially, at least. Okay, so th- it, let me try to sum this up if I understand it. Uh, we're going to come to another article that offers a proposal for what this lead object is. The discovery of the lead, of the material behind the lead object, where it came from, is consistent with your proposal, and it's consistent with their proposal. So it cannot be used to favor one over the other. Is that fair? Did I miss anything in that synopsis? Um, Only that Mazar uh, strongly implies that it's Iron Age 1, that this tablet, or as he would call a sinker, is is Iron Age 1. And what I'm saying is in their own article, they say that lead lead from Lavrion is not being used in Iron Age 1. So I think it does favor my view but it's not conclusive in and of itself. We, we based our dating on three things, the epigraphy, the archaeological mm-hmm. context, and the source of the lead as being an ancillary. Okay, measure. so at, at best, their challenge doesn't undermine this plausibly being one of the three sources, but this isn't a strong point in your favor. You just said it maybe favors it slightly. Yeah, and that's that that's all that all that we ever said. And so okay. it's curious that that Rolston and Mayer made a big point, and then she brought it up as well that we use that as a as a basis as something that was definitive, and we never did that. Okay, I really think the reason that Rolston and I um, uh, Yalom Mac made this point in the first place was because in his article. Uh, Stripling basically provided only the one option. He said, you know, the lo- the mines were operative in the late Bronze Age. Therefore, you know, this is consistent. Yeah, I just, I, I don't think, uh, I just don't think that's good enough. In his article, and this is titled, again, it's the same journal as before. This is in uh, the Israel Exploration Journal. It's called uh, the lead object from Mount Ebal as a fishing net sinker. He offers now a different explanation of what he finds most plausible for this lead object. They're saying, no, we don't buy that the letters are there. We actually think this is just a fishing net, so to speak. So it's a completely different kind of object. Uh, they say it's similar to other lead objects from the time and era during the occupation at the site of Mount Ebal. Uh, these kinds of sinkers were common during that area and matched the material, weight, and size of the tablet. Mazar concedes these kind of weights are rare in the Levant, that it was smashed in antiquity and thus lacks the space for a net's rope seen in most sinkers, that he could not discover them in the major excavation reports from Israel, and he's not sure how or why it would be in the mountainous region of Mount Ebal. And it concludes that the markings recall incisions and decorations marked on the lead sheets used to prepare such sinkers before folding, but could be secondary. Yet, when it's all said and done, he believes the identification as a sinker is adequately secure. So your thoughts before before we hear Stripling's answer, can I uh, just bring that back up for a second? I I I noted this. I, I jotted this down in my notes. Some one of the things that I noticed in this video is that that they're so um, McDowell's never showing you like the text of what what the actual articles are. It took me a few seconds to figure this out, but this looks like. These this basically looks like he's just showing you his own notes of the articles, and and to my mind, I'm I'm like I, I don't know why, <laughs> and I I often find that uh, to to me this looks a little bit like like what uh, you know I th- this is what I've 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 accused Richard Carrier of doing numerous times is is providing his own summaries of scholars' arguments or his own summaries of primary texts. And then when you actually go back and take a look at uh, at the texts themselves, at the articles, uh, they, they tend not to be fairly representative of what the scholar is actually trying to say. 
I don't think there's a, there's there's much reason to spend a lot of time on Mazar's article uh, because really the meat is all in Myers and, and Rolston's. But uh, I do think he makes some important points here, and I'm not sure if Sean is drawing those out clearly enough. Okay. Your response. Okay. Well, let me frame it this way. Okay. We we uh, according to. Mazar's numbers, and he is an excellent archaeologist, but he's out of his lane here. I mean, he we've been corresponding. I mean, he told me he knew nothing okay. about fishing fishing weights until oh. a few months ago, and neither did any of the rest of us. Even though I grew up in a fishing Man. village, but so, uh, and I'm I'm you know I, we have to give Scott Stripling the benefit of the doubt here, right? I mean, I don't know how much how much Mazar knows or doesn't know about uh, about fishing weights. But I think I think they they kind of just gloss right over the reasons why uh, Mazar's made this proposal in the first place. Yeah, and I've seen some pictures. I don't know if you've got any, but I mean, they all look very much the same. Those well, just the ones that he provided in his article, right? I didn't go. Did you go looking for some other ones? I want to say I did. I can't find the pictures now, but I might be able to add them later. But even um, like even the some of the stuff that that he posts in his article like look to me that as as reminiscent right mm -hmm. of of the object itself and also I think I think in terms of in terms of size in terms of of composition the fact that these are all made from these 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 beaten sheets of lead right, right. Um, and they all come from <laughs> uh, Lavrion. Um, there's, there is a, there is a consistency here that, uh, that both, uh, McDowell and Stripling, uh, are not, are not, um, presenting. And I also think that, and this is just conjecture on my part, but I wonder if once they do open the little lead thing, they might find fibers in there and stuff that would definitely maybe single that out as a sinker itself maybe right like i we, we that that's a good point we just don't know what's in there mm -hmm. um beyond what the what the tomographic scans can tell us so i don't know right <laughs> so this is not his area of expertise okay nor nor is it mine but um i will point out from reading his own article several things there's what's called an l2 dot three sinker to use his term which then can be subdivided into a and b there are 333 of these l23 sinkers found in the southern levant or israel if you will ancient canaan of the 333 are you sitting down sean mm -hmm. 331 are type a and two are type b hmm. He, he says that the Mount Ebal sinker is type B. Interesting. The, the only two, that's his analysis. He's calling them type B, not, not the excavator who was Petrie and not Galili who wrote the article that he continually referenced. That's just his own, his own analysis is that those are, those are B. The, the truth is there's never been an L23B sinker found in Israel. These two supposed or candidate ones come from a tomb, what's called the governor's tomb. And it's at a fishing village just near Gaza, Tel El Ajur. And so to find fishing weights near that would not be that uncommon. But at an inland site, out of 333, two possibilities i question mm. those as well okay and those two would be on the coast nothing ever found inland not by the sea of mm. galilee which is the closest fishing body to to mount ebal never found in israel now let that sink in for a second mm. the the type that he's saying we have has never been found in israel with a possible exception of these two at so at can you pause it for a second you know what else has never been found in Israel? What's that? Lead curse tablets. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. it, th this goes this goes in in a couple different directions here. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think like everything that everything that Stripling says about the numbers is, as far as I know, is 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 true and accurate. And I certainly don't know much of anything at all about um 
about lead sinkers. But what I do think is that, um, so the reasons why, the reason I think Mazar settled on on a a sinker as an identification and i'm not i'm not sold on this either um i i actually kind of like uh um robert cargill's suggestion he he just suggested that it was a clasp like for a piece of clothing okay seems reasonable to me right um so uh, but the reason why I think Mazar settled on this, there's, there's a couple of things. First of all, as I mentioned, is the composition. This is something that we know this particular type of lead was used for. Mm-hmm. And if it's the, if it's the time period as well, um, just reading from the article, he says, uh, just before his, uh, his conclusions here, he notes that the groups of the particular types from 13th to the 9th century BCE context are telling the concentrations of such sinkers in the 13th to the 12th century BCE burials at, uh, Akziv Tel El Ajur. Uh, Chania and Parati show that in the Levant in Greece, they bore some symbolic meaning related to the deceased who perhaps were involved in fishing or related trades. So he's saying a couple of things in this article. One of them, importantly, is that we, I mean, we have a lot of these, n- not necessarily from the Levant, right? But we, we have we have sinkers of a slightly different style, uh, around uh around in the levant but but we also have sinkers from all over you know the 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 mediterranean particularly in in the aegean so um and they look very much like what they discovered at mount abal so i think he's he's looking at the object and saying this is what it looks like it looks like all these other things that we have found in these other places and it aligns with uh, with with the uh, uh, the the period with 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 the time period, um, and uh, he, something else he says in here, which I think is important, is is he notes that uh, many of these sinkers have been discovered at burial sites. Stripling himself notes that within Israel, two of the sinkers were found at a at a, a site called the Governor's Tomb. Um, I think Mazar attaches some importance to this and maybe he doesn't say outright say this but he seems to be speculating that um the the uh the symbolic nature of these objects might be a clue to why it was discovered um at mount abal and by the way mount abal is a it it's it was an active cult site um during the period so he's sort of he's sort of looking at the overall context here and looking at where we find a lot of these same types of sinkers in the in the ancient uh, Aegean in the ancient world in the ancient Mediterranean Medi- ter- sorry ancient Mediterranean um, and he's suggesting you know uh, there's a number of these features which seem to align and then there's one more thing here that he notes that they they just kind of gloss right over i'll just read from the uh from his conclusions the folding was most likely done in the levant he says the folding of the of the object however folded ready to be used sinkers could also have been brought from the aegean the monoball object was smashed and compressed in antiquity and therefore lacks the space for the nets rope seen in most sinkers yet its identification as a sinker is adequately secure the signs thought to be letters recall incisions and decorations marked on the lead sheets used to prepare such sinkers before folding but could also be secondary and i think that's kind of an important point Mm -hmm. that they also missed here like he's looking at some of the markings on the the lead object itself and saying you know these are similar to markings that we see on these other lead sinkers which were were marks made on the lead sheets prior to when they were cut up and then folded Mm -hmm. right so it's like it's it's not just it's not just this this 
it's not just a guess that he's throwing out there. Like, like there are, there seem to be some good observational reasons why he makes uh, this suggestion. And, and the other thing too, is that you can't just rule out that it was not, that it was a lead sink because it didn't have like these markings on the outside. Right. Because I that's mean, true. being the fact that it's lead, I mean, that's a very malleable. It's very soft, soft right? Metal. It's very malleable. <laughs> More than likely anything on the outside is going to get rubbed off. And it's yeah. Softened down. So yeah. There are reasons well, oh, why and, you might and, not find any. And, and I'll, I'll say one other thing too here. Um, we already talked about how, you know, if we're isolating it to the period, if we're isolating the the it to the the thirteenth or the twelfth century, um, and I'm totally fine with that. Uh, but <laughs> in terms of what on earth is a sinker doing way up on top of Mount Ball and nowhere near the coast or nowhere near the Sea of Galilee, where you would find fishermen? One of the things that's characteristic of this period is a whole lot of movement of people. Right. We already talked a little bit about this. This is characteristic of what was going on in the Bronze Age collapse. There was an enormous amount of movement and migration uh, out of uh, out of areas in the in the Aegean and in 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 the uh, the the Hittite area on the north and down south and uh, east into Canaan. So, like, I don't know, uh, should we really be that surprised to find some some object, objects in the area which don't at first glance seem to match or fit with, uh, with what we might expect for the uh, native context? All right, let's continue. I think we're getting close to a third of it. <laughs> I'm having fun, so we're good. <laughs> good deal. The Mount Ball tablet has no crease in it where a rope, where a net, uh, a rope would go through to connect to the net. He is that accurate? Because I want to say uh, Dr. Cargill said that there is. I I think he might have said something like that too. And I I, I just I I just don't I mean I just don't know. Um, but I I think it it uh, yeah as you pointed out we can't open it up. The best we can do to see inside it is through these tomographic scans. How confident are we that no, there's nothing like that in there? I don't know. Yeah. Concedes that. He said it must have been smashed in antiquity, but of course has no proof of that. And um, the fact that it's inland, this is, he offers no explanation for that. So mm. those are my problems with this. But he kind of does. I mean, I, I think they're missing it, right? The reason he he says that these objects are often found in, you know, these burial contexts, in these ceremonial contexts. I think he's forwarding that as a reason why maybe it does seem to be out of place. Mm hmm. Now, uh, were there no lakes or rivers where fishing? Well, was the Sea of Galilee is is the is the nearest um, the nearest body of water, right? S significant body of water. So, and uh, it's it's uh, y you know it's it's not close, but it's also not that far away either. Uh, you know, it'd be like I if I remember correctly, it'd, it'd be a, a day or two journey from. Sea of Galilee to to Mount Ball. So I mean yeah, I don't know I it. <laughs> people need while looking for fish. You better believe it that they're gonna have fish brought from somewhere. You know, right. Yeah. Even if it takes two days. Sure. <laughs> Some salt in it. That's it. Vacation. <laughs> I think as Shakespeare would say, "Methinks thou protestest too much." Mm. Okay. Fair enough. Anything else in that one before I, we shift? I'm not, even, I'm not even sure he he used the 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 Shakespearean um, analogy correctly. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what Mazar is protesting too much about. <laughs> right. Third, is it because really he said it was smashed? Is that it? I mean, all he says is it's it's smashed. In antiquity. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like Mazar <laughs> gave him plenty of reasons, and none of them he thought that were considerable enough. Yeah. Oh, so now he's just like you're protesting too much. 
Oh, maybe I get it now. I think, yeah, okay. So I think I think he's suggesting that that Mazar is protesting too much as a, as cover against the very obvious, uh, clear interpretation that that Stripling and his team have given to the object. Okay, I got it. Yeah, that's kind of a deflection, <laughs> in my view. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of the the heart of the debate is. No, let's go for it. All right, let's do it. Okay, so this is in the third article. Uh, again, same journal. And this is written by two scholars, Aaron Mayer and Christopher Rolston. Again, Rolston came on this channel before, offered a great analysis. Uh, and this is titled, The So-Called Mount Ebal Curse Tablet, A Critical Response. And first so, off, they raised some just kind of... Hold on a second. I, I feel like I should maybe say something about... Um, I, I meant to at the beginning and I didn't, but I should uh, say that... that um, uh, I know Chris Ralston. Um, we're 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 in touch relatively regularly. In fact, um, I reached out to him so that I could get copies of um, of these articles for EIJ, and uh, told him specifically that I was I was doing uh, this specific like this response to uh, uh, to Stripling's interview here. So he's aware of um, of of the interview. He's seen it. Uh, he knows, um, that, uh, that, that we're responding to it. And he's been super cooperative, uh, with me as well. Nice. Methodological concerns for the entire project itself. And one of the things that Rolston Mayer ask is they say that you guys claim there's kind of a text on the outside of the tablet and some that's on the inside of it. And they said, since the inside text requires tomographical analysis, why not begin with analyze the potential text outside and using what's discovered there to go inside rather than the reverse? That seems easier and more logical. I agree. In hindsight, that's what I oh. would have done. Okay. So maybe maybe just pause it here for a minute. Um, and that seems sensible, right? Uh, review and publish the the uh the text on the outside of the object before you before you you dig into the the really difficult to read stuff on the inside uh but i got to tell you like i've i've been staring at this thing for well i guess it's been over a year now right since uh since the article came out and i can't see anything on the outside and i <laughs> You know, yeah. their insistence that there's a text on the outside has not managed to convince anyone either. For sure. I mean, because if if it was more clear that there was text on the outside, I mean, that would have been an you easier should thing see to it. prove. Why didn't Don't you, start you think? With that? <laughs> right. You should see yes. it too, right? Yeah. But it, it, and it would have been an easier sell because you wouldn't have to Much rely on easier. Yeah. I haven't thought this through, but uh, just given given what you know, what, uh, what the curse, uh, what, what a defixio was and how it worked. Um, as I said, I haven't really thought through this, uh, very deeply, but something that, that did, um, that I did think about was if this is a defixio, then we shouldn't expect to see any writing on the outside because that's not really how they, they function ritually. Um, like you wrote in the inside and you closed it so that nobody could see what was written on it. Mm -hmm. So, but again, like this is just in my head. I don't, I don't have any of the data for this. So I honestly have no idea, um, if we have defixios that are written on the inside and the outside, it just, it's a question I have, right. Just yeah. at the, uh, at the outset. Hey, fair enough. All right. <laughs> Next. Okay. Methodological, they also challenged the reliability of the find stemming from Mount Ebal itself. Since it was collected, but not sifted until three decades later of the excavation, they say not necessarily probable, but possible it was brought there after the excavation. And even the sifting material itself uh, could have been corrupted or polluted in some fashion. Uh, it that and that's a problem. Like I think that is a real problem, and maybe I would even go a step farther 
to both uh, Myra and Rolston. Uh, and just to give people an idea how this worked, uh, I talked a little bit, I, I talked quite a bit more, and this plays into the political stuff too, right? I talked quite a bit more of that on the video that I did with Paula G. I encourage people to check that out because uh, I think it's pretty great. But um, uh, one of the problems here is that the site itself is in uh, is in Zone B of the occupied Palestinian territory is uh, officially um, part of the uh, the Palestinian Authority, um, which also falls under the Israeli Civil Defense Authority, so the the military jurisdiction of Israel. But as far as I know, they still exercise um, jurisdiction over their own antiquities there. Um, so how this worked uh, is Stripling's team went into Zone B, located in Palestine, and they and they dug up the debris piles and loaded them in dump trucks and took it off site hmm. quite a ways, actually. Like they drove several kil kilometers out of uh, Palestine and to an Israeli settlement called uh, Shivrei Shimron, which is where the actual wet sifting took place. So not only is, is this uh, not in situ, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, and you know all we have to all we have to go on in terms of of the of tracking the reliability and the provenance of this is. Uh, Zertal say so that he dumped all the material from uh, bronze. I think it's from 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 bronze two. I think in he had two dump piles, and he's like, "This was the bronze two dump pile, and this was the iron one dump pile." So they say it came out of the bronze two dump pile. But again, all we have is Zertal say so about that. Mm. Um, if it's a if it's a refuse pile, uh, the the tendency is, I mean, archaeology is is meticulous work, and it has to be it has to be really carefully structured mm -hmm. and organized, just because the uh, the location of your finds are so so critical to their interpretation, right? But once you're uh, when when you're excavating and and you're you're tossing your debris. Um, you know, that's, since that's the stuff that's, that's, that's kind of left over, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's no guarantee that, uh, that it's going to be nearly as meticulously, uh, cataloged. Does that make sense? Right. And that takes away from, you know, any kind of credibility as to, you know, being very precise on huge. There are, there are archeologists who have basically come out and said that this is, this is pretty much a meaningless, uh, discovery because, uh, it was not, it was not part of the original excavation mm -hmm. and they took it off site. Yeah. That's shady. All right, let's continue. It's it's possible, and I, I mean, I have always been open about that. I don't even think that they think that's the case. I just, They're just pointing out that it's okay. Possible. I just I just noticed that uh, that Sean McDowell is drinking out of a Mike Winger coffee mug. So, sorry. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. All right. It it's all propaganda. It, they're all buddies, but that, you know that makes sense, right? So I can see okay. that it's possible. So we have to rely on probabilities. You can see the possibility. Okay, fair enough. One more methodological critique is they also question the identification of, of the site as the site of the altar that's mentioned in Joshua. And here's a quote that they say, since according to the biblical text, the ritual relating to the altar built by Joshua occurs on the slopes of Mount Ebal facing Mount Ger Gerizim on the southern slope. Uh, Zertal's suggestion to move the location of Mount Gerizim to the northeast of Mount Ebal, they, of course, argue is suspect. But your findings rely upon that suspect relocation of where the where the site would be. Your thoughts? Yeah. Is this a fair critique? 
Well, somewhat. Uh, Zertal did come to believe that this was an altar and was, in fact, very likely Joshua's altar. But let me remind the listeners, there are two altars, and they never brought that out in the, the article, although. So, like, this is, uh, uh, all right, I mean, there's there's a fair bit to say here. Um, and just to give people, we, we talked a little bit about this. Um, one of the problems, first of all, maybe maybe now is the time. I'll just show you uh, a picture of uh, like like a reconstruction of the site. Uh, the Mount Abal cult site is a bit controversial um, on a few fronts. So the uh, entire screen. There we go. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pull this up. If you can throw that up there, um, so this is this is quite a good book. Um, this is a nice, accessible book about um, archaeology and religion in in ancient Israel by uh, Zioni Zevit. It was published, well, I think it's two thousand and one. Now it's called the Religions of Ancient Israel: A Synthesis of Parallactic Approaches. Uh, and one of the great things that um, Zevit has done is he's included tons of discussion about uh, archaeological uh, sites and he's provided reconstructions and plans. So here he's got a few pages actually on the Mount Ebal cult complex. You have the, the map there. Um, and the remarkable thing about Mount Ebal is what has been identified as the altar. He's got a reconstruction here. So the remarkable thing about it is that it is enormous. Um, it is far and away. If this is an altar, it is far and away the largest altar by a country mile discovered in the region. Now, that's not to say that there aren't large altars, you know, the, the I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but one of the most magnificent uh, cult sites uh, around is is the, uh, the the Pergamon altar is is no longer in Pergamon, which is in Greece. Uh, they moved it and and um, uh, reconstructed it in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Uh, but it, but it's literally a fills a giant room. This enormous, uh, beautiful, magnificent Greek altar. Uh, so that's this is not to say that. Uh, this is not, you know, it's too big to be an altar, but it's far bigger than anything that's been discovered in the region anywhere. Um, so right away, it, so much so, I'll just read a little bit about what Zevit says about it here. Uh, he says the dominant feature at the site, rendering it important to this study, is a rectangular structure 9.5 by 7.1 meters so uh, what is that for for you Americans? That's like that's over thirty feet by twenty two, twenty three feet, right? Walls oh. one point four meters thick, still standing today to a height of approximately three point two seven meters, or roughly ten feet above the bedrock. Probably its original height. Inclined ramps lead to its top and around the sides. Zertal interprets it as an altar on the basis of its general congruence with descriptions of the second temple altar found in rabbinic literature. Now, recall that that's super late, right? The rabbinic texts were written in the medieval period. Uh, but I'm moving on here. The structure is so unique in the repertoire of Syrian-Palestinian archaeological discoveries that many archaeologists have been reluctant to accept Zertal's interpretation well, if you attempted to explain it either as a watchtower or some sort of domestic construction, counter explanations were either refuted or withdrawn in light of discoveries made around the main structure. The regnant attitude towards Zertal's in interpretation of the installation and the concomitant interpretation of the site as a whole ranges from wait and see to tentative acceptance. So, um, I don't know uh, if if you caught all of that, but basically, like 
And, and here's the thing about it too. Um, so it's not a like it's not a solid structure, right? Like it's 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 a it's a walled structure. And the and Zertal's interpretation is that it was it was filled mm. in, uh, and then a platform was put on top of it, right? Uh, so, but like there's the, the fill is all gone. Like there's, there's no fill in it anymore. It just, it looks like, it looks like walls. Um, okay. you know, so that some have suggested, well, I, it, it, maybe it's a building. I personally think it probably is, uh, an altar or a platform of some sort, some significance. Probably that would probably be an altar, but I think it's important to point out here that there are, there are questions about what even this is. Now, one of the things that Stripling has talked about at great length is the uh, um, Zertal's reports of there being two altars there. He says there's this gigantic platform um, that he dates, I, be I believe it's the platform uh, structure that he dates to Iron One. And then underneath that is a small, he calls, he says there's a small round altar underneath that that dates back to uh, Lake Bronze uh, 2, Lake Bronze 3, whatever is, is at the end there, right? Now, uh, importantly, like I've, I've, I've dug around a little bit in the literature. Something that uh, the uh, Rolston and Meyer point out is 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 pretty important here, and I think I think it's it's uh, it's worth mentioning. Um, let me just pull this up. I have to go back to their article here. Uh, is it the uh, site that you're describing? Is that the same site where the the lead uh, thing came from? Yes. So this is the site where the lead tablet came from. Sorry uh, to be clear there. Um, so here, here's what, uh, importantly, one of the things that Rolston and Meyer uh, mentioned, which I think is significant, is that Zertal's final report of the site uh, was not published before he passed away. And it is still... Uh, not published. Here's what they say. Um, <clears throat> while an extensive preliminary report on Mount Abal was published in 1986 to 1987, a final excavation report was not. Thus, full details on the stratigraphy, architecture, finds, and dating are unavailable. Now, again, one of the things that uh, Stripling spends a lot of time talking about when he talks about money ball is this second altar, right? Supposedly there's this small round altar discovered buried underneath the, the giant platform. And Zertal's interpretation of this was that it's the small round altar that was Joshua's altar and was so special, was so significant. The site became, you know, a place of pilgrimage to the point where they built this enormous commemorative uh, platform over top of it, right? Uh, so that's Zertal's interpretation. One of the things that I have discovered in my survey of the literature about the site that I can get my hands on is that nobody ever talks about this small round altar. And I think the reason for that is because it doesn't factor very prominently in the stuff that Zertal actually published. I think some of this is ginned up a little bit in uh, in in the 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 promotion of the site itself uh, as the site of Joshua's altar. Now, um, so that's I I continue to have issues with with what even the second altar is the second altar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, buried underneath. We just don't know. This was Zertal's interpretation. Nobody's ever seen it. I, I mean, as far as I know, uh, we we've seen. I've seen some poor uh, sketches and renderings of it, uh, but it's it's uh, based on on what what's available. I think there's there's plenty of reasons to remain to continue and have questions about this all right now the other big problem here is the location mm -hmm. of 
the cult site. Uh, so we would expect it on the southern side of Mount Abal, facing Mount Gerizim, overlooking the valley of Shechem, where the biblical text tells us the, the people stood on either side of the valley uh, shouting curses and blessings at one another. The actual site is not just located, you know, on the other side of Mount Abal. It's one and a half kilometers away on the other side of Mount Abal. So that's like a mile away. If you're standing there, can you, you can't see, see Mount it. Gerizim? No. Oh, from, from the, no, you can't even see Mount Gerizim from there. Mm-hmm. No. Like it's, it's, I, I have a, I have a terrific uh, animation of this. Unfortunately, problematically, this structure is located on the north side, which is the opposite side of the mountain from Mount Garazim. It is 1.7 kilometers away and 140 meters below the summit. So this interpretation seems strained and unlikely. It just makes no sense. It makes no sense uh, for this to be the location of Joshua's altar. This was so problematic for um, Adam Zertal that he actually proposed that it, we've got the location of Mount Gerizim wrong. It's not, you know, on the other side of the Valley of Shechem. It's actually on the entire other side of Mount Abal across from the other valley. So he basically, his solution to this in order to to get the interpretation of the the cult site aligned with the narrative in Joshua was basically to suggest that the famous Indiana Jones line. They're They're digging in the wrong place. place. Right? It's actually on the other side. Now, as far as I am aware, there is no one who accepts that interpretation. As far as I am aware, scholars are unanimous as to the location of Mount Abal and Mount Gerizim. What scholars do agree about, I think by and large, as I read from Zevit, is that it's probably an altar. This is likely a cult site. And actually, it's it's not just it's not just the altars or altar. there's an interesting arrangement of stones that surround the site and it sort of looks like it's in the shape of a foot. And there have been, uh, I think it's five or six uh, sites scattered across uh, Israel um, with this similar sort of configuration of stones in the shapes of feet. Um, All the way from like, uh, from the Galilee down down south, I think, to the Shephelah. It's it's pretty widespread. Um, so scholars agree this is a cult site of some sort and seems to have some relationship to these other cult sites. They don't have these, you know, what I called a comically large altar um, previously. They don't have that, but they're, they're clearly cult sites of some sort. It's a cult site. Mm-hmm. That's what scholars agree about. Uh, but... I don't think there's much a very wide acceptance of this idea that this is Joshua's cult site. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, for reasons I already mentioned, it seems to be in the wrong place. Based on the reading, a plain reading of the text, I I can't really make sense of him. You know, if there was a Joshua that arrived there, that he would have built such big... (laughs) Ginormous. Well, remember it was this tight. It was a small round altar, right? The the big platform was a like a like a memorial that that came later. But even then, uh, what Stripling is going to say here is the it. This is the the very well worn apologetic trope, right? Well, the text doesn't specifically say that the altar was on the south side of Mount Abal, so it could have been somewhere else i mean there's no guarantee that just because the people were standing on the south side of mount Abal that they didn't you know leave and build the altar uh, a mile away on the other side and down the slope out of sight of mount gerizim 
that's the argument that Stripling's basically trying to mount here. Um, and it's not one that many, any scholars, I think, I think take very seriously. Mm-hmm. And logistically speaking, it doesn't make sense either. Like, what would you organize some sort of event <laughs> where you've got people on the opposite side? Right. And like, <laughs> see them. It's, it's, it's very odd. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did in ours, they never responded to this. There's okay. a small round altar that Zertal dated to about 1250 BC. They continually misdated um, Zertal's dates and said it was the end of the 13th century. That it was founded in 1250 and it was in operation, the second altar about 1225, and then that was in use until about 1150. In my view, so just, may have just been- for just to provide clarification, the first altar, the one that he dates to twelve fifty, that's the small round one, right? The second, the second altar is the large platform that was built over top of it. Um, but again, the interpretation of these things is all lots of it's up in the air still. Been a little earlier, in their view, it may have been a little bit later, but okay. just using Z- Zertal's dates, we're talking about around uh, twelve fifty. Okay. All right. That's what he dates it to. All right. Mm-hmm. So, w- what about the idea of the site itself being in the wrong place and not matching up with the biblical account? The Bible does. They make an error there. The Bible does not say that it needed to be on the southern slope. I don't know where they got that. May may maybe it's so. Like we we do exercise. You know, I I'm I'm famous for for telling people that that. Uh, you know, you can't just you can't just read common sense into things. Mm-hmm. But this is a situation where the alternative explanation is, like I said, just really, really peculiar. An altar located one and a half kilometers away, you know, 150 or, or 300 meters or whatever it is, lower than the summit of Mount Abal, basically on the other side of the mountain is i suppose you know not contra- not strictly contradicting what it says in the text mm-hmm. but this just doesn't make practical sense of the reading as as you would naturally read it right implied or you could read into that that it was there but it doesn't state it explicitly Adam Zertal had a theory that Mount Kabir on the opposite side may have been Mount Gerizim. And they say, you know, the identification of Mount Gerizim is secure because it goes back to the classical, the identification goes back to the classical period. I agree that the traditional Mount Gerizim is probably the right Mount Gerizim, but traditions dating to the classical period prove nothing. We've got all kinds of Byzantine identifications, which are incorrect. But so um, most, I would say Zertal, I, I don't believe we have any scholars who who are are willing to to say that Mount Kabir is actually Mount Gerizim, though. This is, and, and shouldn't we wait until there's actual evidence of such archaeological such sites? a shift? The can... only the only reason Zertal made that that um, suggestion is because he he saw the need to get the site, you know, in the right place relative to Mount Gerizim. And it wasn't working for him <laughs> with the traditional Mount Gerizim. All came out with his his original identification. Most archaeologists, he got lambasted and most archaeologists oh. dis- disagreed with him. Yes. What does that mean, lambasted? <laughs> What's that? Uh, they, they made fun of him. Um, he got, he got badly, he, he got, he got, uh, uh, badly ridiculed for making this this on the face of a pretty silly suggestion. Gotcha. But the weight of opinion has over time swung back now, to the middle. So uh, this true. is this is a straight. I'm try. I've heard this a few times now, and I'm I have every time trying trying to figure out what exactly Stripling is talking about because. As far as I know, as I mentioned, uh, there's not much disagreement about the location of Mount Gerizim. Hmm. I think maybe he's talking about, like, certainly the identification of the structure as an altar. I think you could say is, yeah, that has shifted 
Because when Zertol made the, the, the suggestion originally, it wasn't widely accepted. And scholars have, by and large, come around. As Zevit said, you know, they've either come to cautiously accept this or basically go, well, you know, in the absence of any other evidence, I'm not entirely sure. So that sounds more like the movement that Stripling's describing, not the location of Mount Gerizim. Just, just the fact that it was an altar. Was an altar, and it's a cult site. Interesting. And I would say at least half of mainstream archaeologists accept Zertal's identification. I've got no problem with them pointing out that not everybody does, because that's, that's okay. a fact. So on some of your conclusions that we're going to get to about the cursed tablet, you guys are on the outside of mainstream scholarship trying to convince scholarship this is legitimate. But in terms of the location of the site, this is pretty mainstream accepted. That's not where the debate rests. That's correct. Okay, fair enough. All right. Here's where I think the heart of the debate really is. When I first talked with Rolston, here's where he just pushed back as an epigrapher. And I realize you have epigraphers on your team and you're an archaeologist. But if this tablet dates to the right place and to the right time, but there's not actually letters here, then obviously this whole case falls apart. So at the root of the question is, are the letters actually there? Rolston and Mayer say they're not. At least the 48 are not possibly a handful, but not the 48 letters that you guys have advanced. I've got three epigraphers on my team, uh, one from Prague, one from Germany, one from Israel, mm -hmm. who are all showing me ancient letters through the tomographic scans on the inside. Based upon, I thought I was going overboard having three epigraphers. Three epigraphers are showing me and telling me that they agree that there are ancient letters on there. Then the question was, what does it say? Can we read it? How does it read? And after studying the, the complex scans for 18 months, let's say, our eyes became very accustomed because it took me time to be able to see. They would tell me we see an Aleph here and we see a Resh there. So I mean, sometimes pause I for a second because it, it kind of makes me chuckle every time he describes it like this because I've had this experience before and it doesn't mean that you're getting closer to the truth. Correct. Right. Yeah. When you're looking at something for a really, even the, even, even those, even like the trained experts, when you're staring at the same thing for a long, long time, chances are you're starting to see things that you want to be there. Oh yeah. I've got an abstract <laughs> painting in my bathroom yeah. and there's like little <laughs> figures and stuff that I've already sort of like come up with on my own. Just, uh, by looking at it. And then I, if I go back and look at them, I see them again. Um, and I, I think if I were to show you something, you'd be like, what are you looking at? I don't get it. Oh yeah. Um, no, I think, I, I, I think this is one of the great, um, uh, bugaboos, I guess, of being an epigrapher, a, a paleographer, the great, the great Achilles heel here is that I think we, we have a tendency to be particularly susceptible to this happening, which is why it's so important to have our stuff reviewed in peer review, to have our peers look at it and go, sorry, man, you're, you're seeing a Rorschach test. Mm -hmm. Like we need that kind of control because the longer you sit with, um, like a text squinting at it and trying to make sense of, you know, the markings on it to see letters. Um, I guarantee you, you're going to start seeing them. The, the challenge is, is to exercise the discipline and control uh, to make sure that you're actually seeing them. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a, it's a called pareidolia. I think there's. Yes. That that's exactly that what issue, it's called. You know, we just, yeah. Even scholars. Even. And I couldn't see it. And then eventually I could train my eye to, to see that. 
drain my eye. It's like he's almost admitting it. It's it's amazing to me, right? Like he's describing the process of what happens when when people when people experience pareidolia. It. <laughs> So, you know, my team had the advantage of being able to study those 3D scans over a very long period of time. We said in the article, this is what we think it says. Okay. Uh, a, one member of my team, Gershon Galil, took a very maximalist approach um, and said, you know, I'm totally confident this is exactly what it says. Uh, Peter and I took a more conservative approach. And if you've read our article, you can see that. We note where we, we disagree uh, within there. Uh, but we said, to the best of our ability, this is plausibly what it says. It's 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 what we think is the best reading that we can offer. We were not in any way dogmatic, but uh, is are there letters of that? I'm 100 percent confident uh, mm. what it says. I don't. There's no way that we can prove that because we don't know that it re if it reads forward or backward or top to bottom. We just presented our best plausible reading. Okay, so you guys had this for 18 months. We're able to look at it in this depth. Uh, is this now made clear to other scholars to go view the same? Are other images uh, forthcoming? All right. Well, maybe we should we should at this point maybe um, talk about what is on the tablet or what's not there and what Stripling and his team think is there. So, um and I think this is at this point. I'll uh, I'll give you my uh, my animation, and uh, we can stick it in there. Okay. So uh, this is a picture of the tomographic scan that um, uh, they 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 provided in the article, and then what I've done is I have taken the drawing. Uh, that was made by Galil and pasted that over top of where he sees letters. So this is his reconstruction of the text on the object. And I've situated it in the place where he says the letters appear in this scan, right? So I'll remove the, the letters here in a minute and you can get a, your, your eyes will adjust to see some of the marks that they are are claiming align with the letters but honestly when you look at that you're probably going what like where the hell did they go where where, where are all those letters right but i assure you that that is the location of where they are seeing the text now uh the text itself uh what does it say i'm just going to pull this up here to get this right it's a curse formula that they have uh, they have suggested, and they the way that they um, they've grouped words, they suggest that that what's happening here is that this isn't a linear text. It's an interesting idea, I think. I don't. I think it's nonsense, but it is an interesting idea. The idea is that this is this stems from such an early period of time that they haven't even figured out. Uh, they haven't figured out basically how to how 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 to situate letters linearly so they're basically um creating words through clusters of symbols mm -hmm. so the, the the letters are close together and that indicates that they make a word um and then it just it just sort of follows a random order. So uh, they've got they broke it into I th I think it's three layers. I've color coded them uh, yellow, green, and blue. And this is based on the article too. They they color coded um, the location of the letters. So uh, the first line the, these are the first two word clusters. The first word is you, and the second word is cursed. And then uh, we continue, and then it says, "By God, by the God Yahweh, you are cursed." Then we have the second grouping: uh, "You are cursed, uh, cursed. You are, um, you, or you will die, or sorry, I think dying you will surely die." And then it's cursed. You are, curse, curse. 
something like that. Mm-hmm. Now, here is the here is the direction of the letters themselves if you follow it from beginning to end. Mm-hmm. The and this is a serious problem because there is no text on earth that is like this. This is there's nothing like this. You don't make words through clustering letters on any text that I'm aware of. Um, We'll talk a little bit about various ways that you do write text, but importantly, none of them corresponds to what Stripling and his team uh, want us to see on the text. And I'll just, I'll just read you their, their translation again of the tablet because this is going to come up again uh so their translation of the tablet is you are cursed by the god yaho or yahweh cursed you will die cursed cursed you will surely die cursed you are by yaho cursed so that's that's the text All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And this concludes part one of two episodes where we're going to deal with this Mount Ebal inscription. So, folks, I do want to encourage you to like and share this video and that you subscribe with that notification bell so that YouTube will notify when our next episode will publish. And I can't wait for you to be there. So until next time, this has been Apostate of Mind.